1962, Hollywood was about to release a cult classic, a movie that is still talked about, Lawrence of Arabia. Among the cast was an Egyptian actor, Omar Sharif. He played the role of Sheriff Ali. He went on to win an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. Maybe the world discovered Omar Sharif in 1962, but in the Arab world, he was already a star, the face of the third largest film industry in the world or as some call it, the Arab Hollywood. It's part of what made Egypt special. If Arabs wanted to watch a movie, they turned to Egypt. They had the money, they had the vision, and of course, they had the actors. Like Fatin Hamama, the lady of the Arab screen, or Shadia, an actor-singer who featured in more than 100 films, or Hind Rostam, often called the Marilyn Monroe of the East. They did all the heavy lifting. Egypt has produced more than 4,000 feature films. That's 75% of all Arab productions. Tells you how they dominated. But recently, Egyptian cinema has lost the old charm. Gulf states have caught up. There are big media centers in Saudi Arabia, the UAE and Qatar. Syrian dramas are a huge thing. So is Lebanese music. It sums up Egypt's journey in the Arab world. Once a beacon of power, hope and unity, now struggling to make a mark. So how did the story unfold? How did Egypt come to dominate the Arab world in the first place and what caused the decline? Time for a flashback. Egypt is no stranger to invaders. The Byzantines, the Arabs, the French, the Ottomans, the British, all of them have invaded this country. So let's start with one such invasion, that of the French in 1798. It was led by Napoleon. Back then, Egypt was a province of the Ottoman Empire. Napoleon captured one part of it. Of course, the Ottomans could not just sit around, so they sent help. And part of that help was Muhammad Ali Pasha. He arrived in Egypt in 1801. In four years, he was appointed the Viceroy of Egypt. How about that for a promotion? Muhammad Ali had grand plans for Egypt. He broke the old oligarchy, retired the religious preachers, and built schools and canals. He was a visionary leader. His successors, not so much. They did build the Suez Canal in 1869, but they also saddled Egypt with debt. Things were so bad that they looked abroad for help. And guess who stepped up? Colonizers in chief, Britain. They bought shares in the canal's operating company. So Egypt's biggest prize now belonged to Britain and pretty soon, so did the whole country. In 1882, the British army occupied Egypt. They would leave only after 40 years. And who did they leave in charge? The descendants of Muhammad Ali. Faud I became king of Egypt in 1922. His son was King Farouk. In 1952, Farouk was deposed in a military coup. We'll get to that in a bit. Now, this part of Egyptian history is very, very important. It gave them a head start over other Arab countries. The society was more dynamic, more tolerant. Science and research was encouraged. So were movies and songs. Consider the city of Alexandria. It was as cosmopolitan as they come. In the late 19th century, you could find all kinds of people there. Greeks, Lebanese, Italians, European Jews, everybody intermingled. So Egypt had something about it. Something Arab neighbors admired from afar. All it needed was a leader, someone with charisma and vigor. Enter Gamal Abdel Nasser. After the Second World War, Egypt was independent on paper. I mean, they had a king, but Britain still called all the shots. Also, in 1948, Egypt lost a war against Israel, so discontent was brewing. A group of military officers decided to right the course. They called themselves the Free Officers Movement. And in 1952, they made their move. King Farouk was toppled. In his place, General Mohammed Naguib was appointed president. He did not last, though. The people knew who the real leader was, the younger, more charismatic Nasser. So in 1954, Naguib was ousted. Nasser took over as the president of Egypt. It was a moment for the history books. For the first time in 2,500 years, a native Egyptian was ruling Egypt. Even Muhammad Ali and his heirs were Ottoman. Nasser was a people's president. He wasn't some entitled aristocrat. He came from very humble origins. And that struck a chord with Egyptians. 
He also realized one thing early on in his presidency. You can't just rule with fear. You need populism. So Nasser implemented land reforms. He gave free schooling to boys and girls, built up the medical infrastructure. All of this made him Egypt's darling. And outside Egypt, Arabs looked at him with respect. Here was a leader who rejected the West, who talked about self-respect, who was basically one of them. He used to tell people, raise your head, fellow brother, the end of colonialism has come. It may seem cheesy today, but in the 1950s, it was a wake-up call. Entire generations had grown up under colonial rule. For them, self-respect was new. Of course, it wasn't all good. Nasser's government was mostly autocratic. He limited civil liberties and rights. He also expelled Jews living in Egypt. But you don't hear about any of that. What you hear about is his leadership of the Arab world. That's the biggest legacy. Under Nasser, Egypt supported freedom movements in Arab countries like in Algeria and Yemen. Even the movie industry flourished. Egypt was releasing more than 100 films a year. Many of them were funded by the regime. And who watched these movies? The entire Arab world. We call it soft power today. In the 1950s, Egypt had three major successes. All of them increased its standing in the Arab world. The first came in 1956, Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal. He decided to kick the British out. Of course, Britain being Britain kicked back. They plotted with Israel and France to retake the canal, which they managed to. But eventually, the US forced them to leave. So Egypt lost on the battlefield, but won the political war. Nasser won, the West zero. The second success came in 1958. Iraqi military officers toppled the monarchy. Their inspiration? The free officers of Egypt. So the Nasser ideology was now spreading. The third success came in 1958 too. Syria made an unusual request to Egypt. They wanted to unite both countries. Nasser was a bit surprised. He thought the time may not be right, but in the end he accepted. And so the United Arab Republic was formed. A union of Egypt and Syria it did not last long, but while it did, a united Arab world was a real possibility. Nasser built on it. He hosted the first Arab League summit in 1964. He hosted the second one as well. Arab countries agreed to shelve their differences. They also agreed to fight Israel together. But on that last one, Nasser failed. In the 1967 war, Egypt lost badly. The entire Sinai Peninsula was captured by Israel. It did not destroy Nasser's legacy but it sure busted his invincibility. Three years later, in 1970, he died. Nasser was succeeded by Anwar Sadat. He was not as charismatic as Nasser, but on the battlefield, he had more success. In 1973, he led Egypt into the Yom Kippur War. And if not for US support, Israel would have lost. But after the war, he decided to pursue peace with Israel, a decision that confused and enraged Arabs. In 1977, he became the first Arab leader to visit Israel. In 1979, he signed a peace treaty with them. Egypt became the first Arab state to recognize Israel, and the backlash was swift. Egypt was kicked out of the Arab League, the same Arab League whose spiritual capital was in Cairo. Anwar Sadat also made another crucial mistake. He unwittingly unleashed the Muslim Brotherhood. Let's take a detour here. The Muslim Brotherhood is a hardline Islamist group founded in 1928. The goal was simple, implement Sharia law across the Arab world. But the brothers found an enemy in Nasser. He was a socialist and a secularist. So the Brotherhood attempted to kill Nasser multiple times. In response, he arrested hundreds of them. But Anwar Sadat had a different policy. He opened up the Egyptian economy. He struck peace deals with Israel. He made enemies on the left. Sadat's solution was to unleash the Muslim Brotherhood. He freed many of them from prison. The hope was that the Brotherhood would neutralize the leftists. Maybe they did. But they also did something else. They slowly radicalized the Egyptian society. Literature, policy, art, movies, everything was slowly affected. And from the late 1980s, they began contesting elections. That too with success. By now, the strains of autocracy began to show. Sadat had been assassinated in 1981. Hosni Mubarak took over from him. His regime was famous for corruption, so Egypt stagnated. But the rest of the Arab world did not. The Gulf states started coming into their own. Their treasury was packed with oil money. The US was giving them weapons, so Egypt was left behind. 
In the 1950s, they were proud of having the largest Arab population. It gave them weight in Arab politics. But by the 1980s and 90s, that became part of the problem. Too many mouths to feed. Egypt's population was around 20 million in 1950. By 1980, it had more than doubled to 43 million. By 1990, it reached 56 million. Now, it's not like farming is impossible in Egypt. During Nasser's time, Egypt grew its own wheat. Even today, agriculture makes up more than 10% of the GDP, but the type of agriculture matters. Most of it is cotton and berries. You can't feed that to your people. In simple words, Egypt has very few resources, but a lot of people. So what did their leaders do? They borrowed and imported. Today, Egypt is the second largest IMF debtor. It tells you everything that you need to know. So what comes next? Domestic politics is still an issue for Egypt. Mubarak was ousted during the Arab Spring. After that, the Muslim Brotherhood tried to go mainstream. Their proxy candidate became president for a while, Mohamed Morsi. But he too was toppled in 2013. And that's how the current president came to power, Abdel Fateh al-Sisi. He was up for re-election this week. The results are a foregone conclusion. As for Egypt's golden age, I'm afraid that ship has sailed. The country first needs to find its identity. Is it cosmopolitan and progressive? Or is it hardline conservative? Same with Arab leadership. There are new kids on the block now, so Egypt is not the tall leader it was. It is now a mediator between Israel and the Arabs. They say Cairo is a place where the past is never far from the present. But Egypt's past looks pretty distant right now.